Hey guys, it's uh, Friday, July the 10th, 2020, and today is my oldest girl's birthday, my third child, and we celebrated her today and um, had a good time. So um, the um, thing I want to talk about today is something that, and it's going to be a long story, so please bear with it. I think it's worth listening to. And I'm going to somehow draw a relationship with George Floyd with a personal relationship that happened to me and my wife. And uh, you may not see the parallel, but at the very end, I want you to see the result of what maybe we did versus what maybe how the reaction of some people were it was. It says nothing to do with me and my wife and George Floyd. This is me and my wife uh, 18 years ago. <clears throat> so real quick, not real quick. This is going to take a while. So back in um, 2011, me and my wife found out we were pregnant. We went in for our eight-week appointment, and everything looked fine. Um, it's our first child, and we were excited about it. Our next appointment was going to be the gender identification or gender reveal visit. So we got to the gender reveal visit around week 15 or week 16, and the nurse that was in there was doing the ultrasound, and she she was going across there, and she, she stopped and said, okay, she said, here's a good picture right here of baby A. And um, me and my wife said, how do you know what we're going to name the baby? It doesn't begin with A. We don't know what we're going to name the baby. We don't know what it is. And she goes, oh, she said, well, because over here is baby B. And we were like, whoa, we didn't. And she's like, you didn't know that? I was like, no, 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 we didn't know that. We were all, And we were excited, super excited. But she called the doctor in because she noticed some things that were trending in the wrong direction. And to make a real long story short about that experience, um, we, they had twin to twin transfusion, which is where the identical twins share the same sac and they're separated by like a membrane. Uh, the amniotic fluid is, is different amounts because of the membrane, but they um, share the same lifeline obviously. And um, so the problem with twin to twin transfusion is one twin tends to be malnourished while one is overnourished. So had, my wife had to go on bed rest and we had to get checked constantly, at least once or twice a week. And we, and at times we had to do amniocentesis just to draw fluid off one of the babies because there was too much on one and not enough or hardly any on the other. So one was growing a little bit faster than the other. And around week 24, right at week 24, it was a Sunday night, my wife noticed some discomfort and she said something just happened, something's not right. We went into the doctor and sure enough, um, one of our babies had passed, it was baby B. And um, that was a uh, you know, tough thing for us to, uh, to handle. But um, at the same time, we still had one. And that's you know, kind of what we thought initially anyway. So, but she said, it's not looking very good for this other one. She said, we got to really monitor it closely. So I think we were in there like every other day or every day thereafter for four days. And on a Friday we went in, she said, um, guys, she said, he's not gonna make it much longer in the womb. There's too much being passed over dead matter from the baby that passed or whatever. Of course, this I'm not medical, so I don't understand all this really. I'm just kind of saying, okay, okay, let's save him. So we had to make the decision to go ahead and C-section him out. And so that's what we did on Friday morning on February 15th. And um, so when uh, we, 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 we went through the process, there was a lot of nurses in there, 16 or 17 nurses watching. And it was a very intimidating time and they, uh, the, of course, when they did the C-section, they had to pull out the, the, the deceased baby first, and that was that was heartbreaking. And they pulled out our, our, our other baby, and uh, the, the doctor told me, she said, here, she said, now's your chance to hold him while he's alive. And I said, mm, mm I said, I don't know if I can do it. And of course, I was bawling, and so I held him, and uh, I was happy, you know, it was my first child. And so they took him back, they intubated them. They did, you know, they, they, they did everything they could constantly. And they told us constantly for days on end that this baby wasn't going to make it for days, for weeks. They even asked us to basically not let him make it, that he was going to be, well, one of the doctors in particular said he'd be unfruitful to society. By the way, that's my baby that's 18 years old now, the one we're talking about. So um, he has a lot of physical dis impairments, disabilities, but... Um, I'll tell you more about him in a minute. But when we were in the hospital, first couple of weeks, every few hours, they just, and finally we just said, you know what, quit telling us he's not going to make it. If the Lord wants to take him, the Lord will take him. 
he's kept growing. He kept getting better. He went through tons of trials. He had tons of things wrong. We knew he could, you know, dime-sized lungs, renal failure, grade three and four brain bleeds, uh, spinal tap reservoir, um, eyes that could maybe not develop, you know, uh, I mean, you name it. It, it was, you know, there's all kinds of it, cerebral palsy. So um, we're like, you know what? We don't, my wife, I, I don't care. It's my firstborn. It, it's, it's, I don't care what's wrong. I don't care what's wrong with him. I'll take care of him. So they finally quit talking about that. But there's a situation that occurred, and this is my key. At two months old, Tate was two and a half pounds. He came off the, one of the respirators, one of the machines, one of the oscillating machines and got on like a, a CPAP was doing really well with his breathing and his and his um, levels and stuff were just greatly improving. But one night when we changed the bed out, the incubator, we always help change out the stuff. We had a nurse that was pregnant and she um, helped, you know, obviously with the change around eight, nine o'clock that night. We left around 9.30, 9.45. I could never get a sense of peace about that night. Something wasn't right. And sure enough, the next morning we got a phone call. There was a situation that happened. The bed that was, he, the incubator that he was in was in a preheat mode and it never left preheat mode. And this happened between the hours of nine and 12.30. After they started cooling him down, they got him down to 107.9. His body temperature. And he was about two and a half pounds. And so, um, doctor said he had twitching, he had um, more brain bleed, all because of um, the fact the nurse didn't check the baby every 15 minutes like she was supposed to. Somehow there was about a three or four hour window there where she may have walked by, but she sure didn't put her hands on him or she would have known that bed was burning up because preheat mood goes off after a very short time. Whether the bed was a default, whether the, uh, we don't know. Um, the bed was trashed, I'm sure. But the nurse was at fault. My, my baby almost suffocated. My baby almost died of overheating and exhaustion and suffocating and cardiac arrest and everything else. He was two and a half pounds. He couldn't even scream. He was tubed down the throat, nasal cannula, in the incubator. Couldn't scream, but he was fighting. He was fighting, he was pulling everything out he could to let them know something wasn't right. <clears throat> he um, he was set back about two weeks. But the day after, <laughs> the same nurse was in there. And, um, you know, as bad as my inner self probably just wanted to just get super angry and super mad. And we knew she was at fault. And they even asked us, you know, what do you want to do? You fire her or whatever. My wife says, um, we should forgive her. I said, what? I was like, forgive her. She said, yeah, we need to talk to her, pray with her, and forgive her. So guess what we did? We talked with her, we prayed with her, and we forgave her. She basically had him suffocated um, she basically didn't do her job what she was trained to do um, you, know, you don't hear about things like that that happen in hospitals uh, my son shouldn't be alive um, the great thing is he, he has more of an impact on people than most kids I've ever met just because when you see him and know him you love him you remember him you pray for him you want to know how he's doing he's just one of those special kids so um what does this have to do with george floyd henry why did you bring up such a stupid idea and i said you know so many people are angry at the cops for what they did whether what they did was in their training or not, I, I think it, I think they were trained to do this. I think he may have exacerbated his training techniques. But at the same time, the nurse was trained to do a certain thing, and she exacerbated certain things she did. 
or, or lack thereof. What did we do as Christians when they almost killed my son? And my son didn't die. It was if he if he died, I, I don't I don't think things would have been differently. But but it definitely he he had more issues because of this situation. So I have every right to be angry. But what did we do? What did my wife do? Really? She forgave her. Hmm. If people would just forgive and say, you know what, Minnesota law enforcement, train them better or get, get, them, get them out. Same way with a nurse. Train, train them better or get the bad ones out. They're not going to watch the kids. Get them out. So, I, you know, you may say, Henry, that is the dumbest comparison ever. But I, you know, I started thinking, I was like, we are so quick to mount up against people that may have good intentions and things turn out wrong. And then they look like they're the worst thing in this world. But if they did what they thought was right, and I'm not saying the George Floyd situation was right. I mean, I could go down a list of a lot of other things, Breonna Taylor. I'm not even going to start naming stuff. But I'm saying we got to be careful about these, especially law enforcement or people that are in self-defense, just because it's a white and a black or whatever. I mean, the nurse we had was white. Uh, so that, you know, that, that, that doesn't matter. They're all they're, people are human. They're going to make mistakes. They're not going to do their job properly all the time. But guess what? That's that's not for me and you to figure out. What what God and what Christ taught us was to forgive and move forward. Forget it and drive on, as Pastor Bill says. That's tough when someone damages your kid, kills kills someone. I mean, it's tough. But you just need to move on and grow from it. So. And my wife was the strong one there, for sure, because I, I I probably would have uh, I would react a lot differently had I been solo. But um, so just think about that when you're thinking about these situations that occur. You know, let the justice system take its course. What are we supposed to do as a Christian? I think we did it the right thing, um, and I hope you hope you appreciated the story. Um, that was a condensed version. I could tell you a lot more about it, but no reason to. That's what happened. And he's doing good now. So y'all take care.